Uh, Dave Bavin, um, he's, he, he was part of the Pine Martin recovery team in Wales, uh, where 51 Pine Martins were brought down from Scotland and translocated to Wales. And that's, that's turned out to be a very successful program and the Martins are increasing and spreading now. And it's actually set a kind of standard for translocation, in my view anyway, at least. So, um, Dave, um, it's over to you. And so uh, we're looking forward to hear what you've got to say. Thanks, Hugh. Great. So, yeah, thanks for the uh, introduction, Hugh. And um, yeah, and greetings from Scotland. I'm sorry that we can't be there with you um, today, but uh, hopefully, and I also apologize in advance if our bandwidth doesn't quite hold up to the standards that uh, have been set so far. But I'd like to talk to you about um, the human dimensions of Pine Martin conservation um, based on our experience of working in Pine Martin conservation. Um, throughout the translocations and before that, um, mainly in Wales, but also from experiences in Scotland and obviously we're, we're an, aware, an awareness of what's been going on in Northern Ireland and Ireland as well. And um, it's, it's useful for me to follow John Linnell's excellent talk this morning because a lot of what John said um, in, informs our approach and hopefully will be reflected in, in what, we're, what I'm going to talk about. But we, we, we have a a successful situation, I suppose, at the moment in that in Britain and, and in Northern Ireland and Ireland, the island of Ireland, protected carnivals are generally recovering. So the range and abundance of most protected British and Irish meso carnivores is increasing. Now, obviously, we don't have any of our large carnivals left, um, but for the smaller ones um, that at some points in our recent history have not been doing so well at all, they are now generally recovering in range and abundance. So the, the conservation emphasis, um, it's going to shift. It's going to shift from basically sort of emergency triage of these populations to the facilitation of coexistence over time between people and these species. Um, and so what we're interested in, or what, we're, what we need to start to understand is what, what are the challenges associated with the um, conservation of these carnivals in a contemporary British and Island of Ireland landscape. So there's, there's a few core drivers which affect people's perceptions of carnivores. We have to contend with this phenomenon, phenomenon of shifting baseline syndrome, whereby for, for multiple generations now, people have been living um, in Britain and Ireland in the absence of carnivores generally, or at least um, their experience of carnivores has been of, of populations in, with very low abundance. Um, and so people are not generally used to living in environments where their where encounters or experience of carnivores is, um, you know, becomes a fairly regular occurrence. And so, and also whilst our carnivores are recovering, um, some of the prey species of those carnivores are endangered or in decline. And that's going to pose novel challenges for us in terms of balancing conservation objectives across the board for these different species. Um, predation, generally, and um, I, this is my experience, I suppose, particularly in um, Wales, England, and Scotland, is predation is often perceived to be a negative force um, across the board. It's not necessarily recognised that predation is a, is a fundamental driver an evolutionary process. And so generally we have, um, or I've found that particularly amongst the public, there is um, an aversion to predation generally. And um, we have to bear in mind that the protected carnivals, they're recovering into highly altered, fragmented and peopled landscapes. So we need to anticipate as best as we can or be able to react as best as we can to novel interactions um, with people and wildlife from these recovering carnival species. A lot of the time, and John touched on this, is there's attitudes and views towards carnivores um, are often um, seated in um, underlying phenomena, which are not necessarily um, directly related to that species. So the fear of unknown and a loss of control um, underpins a lot of people's reaction towards carnivore species. Um, and this is particularly the case where there's a perception of exposure to direct harm um, whether this is real or perceived, or an economic threat. Um, you know, the models of production that we employ for um, food and for resources, generally, um, you know, they try and minimise risk 
and they try and maximize predictability. Um, and carnivores and lots of wildlife, they're free agents. You know, they're, they're autonomous beings in their own right. And um, they can often there present or, or be seen to be risky because they can't necessarily be accounted for in, uh, in what we like to do, which we, as I said, we try and make things highly predictable. We also have a situation, and this is a bit of a legacy, I suppose, of conservation policy, a, a distrust of power amongst environmental stakeholders. Um, so people distrust or have experience of top-down implementation of environmental and policy objectives. And carnivores are often seen to be symbolic of, um, of power imbalance or of an imposition of, of power or agenda by, for example, government, statutory bodies or conservation organizations. And so this, these kind of underlying grievances can, can become manifest around the carnival species that we're working with and pine martens in this case. And then all of these are generally nested within a, a shift that we've been seeing over the last 60 or 80 years or so, which is a paradigm shift in values, particularly in Western society, um, in, our, in our value orientations towards nature. And then moving generally from anthropocentric values, which is you know, the, the idea of nature for people, where nature, we, we utilize nature and it serves us and it has an economic um, value and we exploit it. And we're seeing a slow shift now or actually, well, now we're seeing an accelerated shift towards more ecocentric values where um, the culture is developing to think about nature alongside people and to be intrinsically valuable outside of having any utility value for people. And um, this, this, is a, this is a continuum. This is a shift that's ongoing. And the space in the middle as those two paradigms diverge is, is, is fertile ground for conflict, particularly around objectives associated with carnival recovery or carnivore reintroduction and management. So what I'd like to talk about is our experiences of investigating the social feasibility um, of carnivore recovery, uh, translocation and coexistence. And this, this draws directly from our experience of um, assessing this for the pine martin translocations, which we undertook where we moved um, pine martins from Scotland to Wales. Um, and also more recently, we used um, Q methodology, which we used in Wales for the pine martins um, to conduct the first social feasibility assessment of potential Eurasian links for introduction to Scotland. So the, we used, yeah, Q methodology was a method that we have, that has been a core component of both of these investigations of social feasibility. Um, and it's, it's a method which um, measures the subjective perceptions of people towards a given topic. And what it does is it provides, or we found that it's able to provide quite a deep, um, nuanced investigation of how people feel towards, in this case, Pine Martin translocation and uh, potential links for introduction. Um, and we, were, we found that it's able to, they're, they're able to represent marginalized voices or, or voices which might be overlooked by traditional public opinion survey style surveys. And so what I'll do now is just report on our, our use of this method um, with the Pine Martins, with the Pine Martin translocation and, um, and what, it, what it demonstrated to us or what it highlighted to us um, in terms of people's views towards both pine martins, translocation as a tool, and also pine martin recovery more generally. We carried out the study. Uh, the field work was carried out by myself and Hugh Denman, who just uh, introduced me, in uh, Pontre de Grois, which was, um, so the map you can see is of the areas that we released the translocated pine martins in mid Wales. And um, so what you can see there is, I've, I've lifted this from Cap McNichol's paper, and um, it highlights the, the established territories of the Pine Martins after, after a couple of years of being released. And Pontre de Grois was a, a community central within that release area. And we worked with that community to conduct this, this um, social feasibility assessment. So we identified four very distinct perspectives towards Pine Martins and the transl translocation. And, um, it was useful because we were able to identify areas of consensus and divergence in the community members' views towards um, Pine Martins. And we were also able to highlight that a lot of these views were influenced by wider issues and underlying factors, which, is, which are crucial to understand. If we, if, we, if we want to 
gain a holistic understanding towards people's perceptions of these species that we need to work with, then um, we need to be aware that there's, there's, there's wide dynamics and underlying issues at play, which we, which we need to be, we, we, we need to have in our, in our minds when we're, we're engaging with people. So the most dominant perspective that we encountered was this environmental protectionist perspective. So they supported translocation and pine martin recovery. They had, they generally have strong environmental values and um, they perceived that pine martins were intrinsically valuable. Um, they were valuable beyond what they could deliver for people. They had a, a right to exist. Um, and they felt that there was an ethical imperative to recover lost wildlife where possible. And they supported reintroduction and translocation as a method to do this. Uh, they were very pro rewilding and they were very anti wildlife management. They didn't like the idea that wildlife should be managed. They think that wildlife should be left to govern themselves as they, as they wish. Um, and they generally supported efforts to um, reduce the level of wildlife management in the environment. And there were strong anti-farming sentiments within this group um, and anti-sport shooting sentiment. So they, there was a general belief that farming had been a strong contributor to the decline in biodiversity in Britain. The second perception was this, what we, what we call a natural resource steward. Um, and so they supported pine martin translocation. Um, they perceive that pine martins are part of native woodland ecosystems and that um, by virtue of, of evolving within these systems, they play important roles. Um, however, there is an element of um, this utility value or this utilistic valuing of pine martins. So they believe the strong driver was that they thought pine martins would deliver ecosystem services or economic benefits if they were able to um, contribute to the management of gray squirrels. Um, and as such, they then had, they did have some concerns over, for example, the impacts of pine martins on forest management um, and whether their protected status and designations would um, impede management of woodland. And there was a third voice, which we um, characterize as a cautious pragmatist. Um, so they are pro wildlife recovery, but they're quite ambivalent about translocation as method to achieve this. So their experience, and well, and, and they have a very really jaded experience in environmental and conservation schemes. Um, they are, their experience is that conservation, that conservation policy is, is generally quite top down, um, that there tends to be a bit of a power imbalance and that there's often a lot of short term thinking. So they're concerned about the long term and about unintended consequences for the people that have to coexist with these species. Um, and their perception of conservation is just that they generally parachute in, deliver a project, but then disappear without necessarily dealing with any of the, the problems that arise. Um, and they also have some concern for the predation of livestock, lambs in this case. And this, this harks back to shifting baseline syndrome and a, and a lack of familiarity with what a pine martin is. There was a general perception that they were larger than they were and that they were predators of livestock. And for them, social justice in the delivery of carnival conservation is key. So the resolution of potential negative impacts, it, it has to be demonstrated to be equitable. So they're not anti-carnival, but they think that carnival conservation um, and translocation in this case, it has to be fair. Um, it has to be demonstrated that it can um, uh, incorporate social justice as well as environmental justice into an approach. And then we had a voice which we characterize as a concern manager. So they, they opposed the translocation. Um, they were generally anti-predator and thought that predators had become too abundant by virtue of protection. Uh, the pine martin translocation was thought would, would lead to the loss of wildlife. Um, they strongly feel the wildlife needs to be managed um, and that it's their role as custodians of the environment to manage wildlife. And that primarily uh, means lethal control of predators. Uh, they, they did feel that pine martin was vermin um, and they felt that pine martins had been exterminated for a reason, that the, that, you know, the reason that they'd been hunted out or trapped, um, you know, this wasn't done for fun. There was a strong reason why this had been done. And they also felt that pine martins would be shot by the people who don't, who don't want them to, to return. And there's this, this, this feeling that we will deal with problems that arise our own way, um, which again, imply lethal control of those animals. So we did find consensus across 
community or the people that we that we engage with. So one was they generally people generally desire a biodiverse environment. It's just that we found that people have quite subjective views of what constitutes desirable biodiversity. So you know why introduce another predator when you could focus your efforts on ground nesting birds? Um, and again, this was especially the case with the concern managers. They, they did not consider predators to be sort of a desirable element of biodiversity. And in some cases, they felt that their management of wildlife was an effective surrogate for the presence of those predators. There was also consensus. So this, 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 this study and this the translocation came just after Emma Sheehy's work in Ireland, which highlighted this fascinating relationship between pine martins, red squirrels and gray squirrels. And this was well publicized um, in popular media. And so there was a consensus that the environmental impacts of gray schools are negative, and it would be a positive if pine martins could reduce those numbers. So it was conceded even by the concern managers that if pine martins could have some kind of regulatory impact on gray schools, that would be a positive thing. We found there were two underlying phenomena that had a strong influence on people's views towards pine martins. One of them was badgers. So badgers are, and the, and the protected status of badgers is a contentious issue in a lot of um, Britain, probably Ireland as well, although I'm not as familiar. Um, it was perceived by some that the protection of badgers has led to a sort of an overabundance and with impacts on other wildlife and that their protection means that they're untouchable and that they can't be, people can't take, people lose agency in being able to manage the environment around them as they see fit because they, uh, because these species have protected status. It was also thought that they were carriers of disease based on the TB um, dynamic. And it was felt that pine martins would therefore also be carriers of disease. And the people aligning with the concern managers, they, they don't feel that, com com that conservationists are competent or willing to grasp the nettle to address this thorny issue with the protected status and the perceived increase in abundance of badgers and their impact on wildlife. So they thought that, that would be the case with the pine martin as well, that it would be protected, it would be untouchable, and people wouldn't be able to do anything if there was an impact on wildlife. Um, and then, but in the case of the environmental protectionists, for example, they thought, they felt that species like the badger were being illegally persecuted by farmers and they felt quite bitter that this was the case, that there was, that the, the, the people were able to act outside the law. We also found that rewilding had a strong influence on people's views. And again, this came out, we were doing this study about the time that George Monbiot published Feral, where he was extremely um, scathing of Welsh sheep farming practices. And so rewilding at the time was highly emotive and divisive, and it was incredibly value laden. And it was pine martin recovery became associated in lots of people's minds with rewilding objectives. So pine martins, it, we often heard the refrain, you know, this is the thin end of the wedge, what next? Are pine martins paving the way for the reintroductions of increasingly scaled up predators like lynx and wolves and bears? But again, the environmental protectionists, they perceived uh, rewilding as positive because they felt it was reversing the damage caused by humans. They felt that it was an ethically justified um, approach to environmental management. So we gained a deeper understanding of people's perceptions of pine martins and their potential recovery by translocation. What we were able to highlight is that there's potential for conflict between people over pine martins and their recovery and coexistence. In highlighting these and being able to understand it, we kind of laid out a bit of a roadmap in how to approach pine martin conservation and the translocation. So I, th I feel we were able to reduce the chances, well, we were able to reduce the chances for certain voices to feel marginalized and devalued. And um, we saw this with the, with the Eileen O'Rourke's great paper associated with white-tailed eagles is that when voices in opposition are marginalized and devalued, then they can act on that. And although the concern managers were a relatively small proportion of the voice within the community, they had a disproportionate potential influence because they were landholders and they, and they acted quite autonomously um, on that land. So they had the ability to affect the fortunes of the Pine Martins. Um, but in recognizing their concerns and being able to address them, we were able to, to minimize the chance of them feeling marginalized and feeling like they had to react. So we were able to use this information to sort of sensitively engage with the focal communities and to anticipate potential conflicts. Um, this doesn't 
this doesn't necessarily mean that we were able to manipulate our messaging. It just means that we were able to um, effectively target where information needed to be disseminated. And we were also able to be then sensitive of the potential conflict between people over Pine Martin. So Pine Martins had the potential to be a, a focal point for conflict. And so we were just able to be aware of that and to try and minimize the risk of this. And also then to design mitigations to promote coexistence. And yeah, that's what we've come on to through for both information dissemination, um, personal contact and practical measures we're able to promote coexistence and anticipate conflicts before they arose. So the future, and John touched on this, um, is, is coexistence. And that, as, as John said, that doesn't mean um, a sort of utopian ideal of harmony, because that's unrealistic. What it means is that we, we're going to be looking to stay ahead in a continual process of co-adaptation between people and carnivores. And in order to do that, we have to be seen to be responsible. So we have to make an effort to really truly understand the situation and to empathize with people who are potentially affected. And we need to understand what people require in order to feel safe, um, supported, and trusting, trusting of conservation agencies and organizations. And so, um, you know, investigating the human dimensions of these situations um, is, is, is absolutely fundamental to underpinning um, long-term conservation, which is going to be much more about promoting coexistence rather than emergency triage of populations. So I'm been hoping that's quite well in time and I've left time for questions. Um, I've tried to keep it as snappy as possible. So yeah, thank you for listening. And um, any questions? and very uh, clear presentation. So I'll ask the live audience here if they have any questions first. I have a question actually, but <laughs> I think there are probably some questions from uh, the we, remote audience as we well. We do have one from our audience and we are running a little bit behind. Well, I'll get um, this one to Dave. Dave, that's fascinating. It's really, really interesting. We think the carnivores are, are, are the issue, but I think humans and, and our attitudes and behaviours are, are fascinating. Um, so I've been asked, um, interesting in that the environmental protectionist groups were anti-management but pro-translocation of Pine Martins. It seems a contradiction. Yeah, basically these, um, these things are full of contradictions. So um, although, yeah, the environmental protectionists are broadly ecocentric in their values, um, you know, there are, they, they also, although I didn't include it there, they're also very pro wildlife tourism, which again is, um, would be in contradiction to the idea that they um, want to take a very hands off approach with the wildlife. So yeah, I've, I've no explanation other than that, that people are highly contradictory. Um, in a lot of their views and that's to be expected because we're messy you know we're influenced by lots of things aren't we uh, experience aesthetic culture religion there's going to be some contradictions in there any further questions oh i got time for a quick question yeah a very quick question yeah dave um you, you mentioned your work in scotland uh, with the links um can you give some quick feedback as to what differences and what similarities in uh, the results in terms of classification and characterization of the groups that you found in Scotland compared to Wales? Yeah, that's a great question, Hugh. So, so that report will be publicly available quite soon. But broadly, broadly, there was similar spread of views. The, the perspectives that we derived from the link study were, were different you know, because they're obviously specific to that question. But there was a general theme that there was a strong voice, which you could, which you could characterize as environmental protectionist, which again was very pro, we're quite pro rewilding and, um, and very much saw the intrinsic value of links and saw that links would benefit the system holistically. Um, and then there was, I guess, those middle voices, which, um, thought about the potential economic or ecosystem service benefits of links but recognize that there might be management issues and snags that need to be addressed um, and then there was yeah this again a, a, a voice of strong concern which was associated with um, protecting human interests so in this case sheep farming and sport shooting and protecting or, or just prioritizing the um, 
the thriving of human community, um, which we all do. But I, I would say this, this, there were specific differences, obviously, by and I, th I think these voices and, I, and in the paper that we produced, we highlighted this, that these voices are um, they turn up in a lot of conflict or conservation conflict situations such as red grouse and raptors in Scotland, uh, the situation with white-tailed eagles in Ireland and over on the west coast of Scotland. Um, these, these, these voices, although there's contextual differences based on the question, some of the fundamental tenets are similar. And I think, again, that underpins this, this paradigm shift that we're seeing at the moment between these, this development of more ecocentric values and those more traditional anthropocentric values. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, I'm sure we'll all look forward to uh, uh, reading about your work in Scotland as well. Thank you very much. Round of applause. No problem.